Portugal are European champions. Of what, you might ask? Well, football for one. Hockey is another one. And I think long jump and the marathon and... Uh, and honestly, it's kind of hard to keep count because in the past month or so, it's been a while since we posted an episode of this podcast, I know, and that's because my wrist is injured and I can't edit, but I've been doing a bunch of interviews. It's summer festival season now, so I just did a bunch of them, so there's lots more made of things where this is coming from, ha 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 ha, which is this microphone. So, uh, basically, um, Portugal just uh, became champion, a European champion champion rather uh, of um, of a bunch of things and it's been messing with the Portuguese mindset I think it's pretty obvious to everyone that it's giving us something that's not necessarily uh, very Portuguese uh, because a uh, winning uh, mindset from you know from the get-go is not something that we are very used to in fact we are very much you know there's a culture of uh, not being able to reach your goals but then kind of uh, setting your goals uh, impossibly high and then just kind of mourning the sensation of uh, winning, which is well, of, when well, it's not it's not winning, but it's still uh, it's still very much just like uh, lowered expectations, I would say. Uh, actually, no, technically it's higher expectations, which is actually misleading in its own because this just goes to prove what's been happening in the past few few months that. Um, that we can make it. Well, of course we have one of the best players in the world, but uh, and an amazing team, seriously, but we didn't play very well. We, uh, or at least when we did, we did not score many goals. But then we just got pretty much pragmatic with the whole thing, and uh, the Greeks did it once, and uh, I think we played better than the Greeks did when they won. Over here in Portugal, actually. So this matters to really no one if you're not from Portugal, uh, so I'm gonna skip ahead, and uh, I have an announcement to make. Uh, first off, I would like to welcome you all. It's uh, hello to everyone from me, and welcome to another episode of the Made of Things podcast. My name is Antonio Maria Correia, which is a Portuguese name, because I'm from Portugal and I love things, so I talk to the people who make those things. Before we get to our guests, I have an announcement to make. It's been fun doing this podcast, but Made of Things will now be turning more to what it should always have been, and that's a YouTube channel. I've been doing interviews with musicians and artists in general since 2004, so it's been 12 years and I've always done my work as video. Uh, the podcast still allows me to sometimes just interview interview people in audio, but I'll do video every time I get the chance. So does this mean I'll be quitting the podcast? Yes. Yes, it does. No, no it doesn't. I'll still keep posting because, well, one, there are interviews I'll only do in audio form, and two, I can talk to you guys directly and comment on what happens on each episode, for instance, and three, lastly, because it allows me to say weird stuff to you and talk about weird things and talk about whatever... I want, really. So, yeah, please go to the Made of Things channel on YouTube and have yourself uh, some fun. And I'm now way more active on Instagram and Twitter, so go follow Made of Things on there, alright? Uh, it's fun, I promise. And you can always download everything in the world, <laughs> ever, uh, through the WordPress Made of Things page. So, this time on the show, we have Dr. John Cooper Clark. John is a living punk legend, but even though he has made records, he's not necessarily a musician. Then again, maybe he is, in a way. But, you know, John Cooper Clark is a poet, also somewhat of a comedian, and uh, a living, breathing personality of, well, s disruption, maybe? Mm. Uh, his live act is a bit of a mix between reciting poetry and dishing out jokes, but it's very rock and roll. John Cooper Clark was lovely to talk to, and I hope you enjoy this as much as we did. We also, oh, and we also got to talk about some comedians from the UK, uh, whom I love very much. And don't forget that this interview is already on YouTube uh, as a video interview. Even though you might be listening to this podcast on YouTube itself, 
there's probably a link on uh, the suggested links to the side, and uh, you can probably uh, just see th this John Cooper Clark video interview if you're stationary and n are not walking around. But I'm keeping this in audio form also because you can listen to me on the move. Fantastic. So I'll get back to you at the end of my talk with Dr. John Cooper Clark. Like 95% of your shows have been written, I can imagine. Uh, maybe in your in, in your whole lifetime. Uh, I don't think the figure would be that high. I, th I think uh, I think I, I, I'm, I'm circumnavigated the globe nine times doing what I do. Really? So I'm not limited to the English-speaking world, but it always. You know, I, I, I got to admit that uh, uh, I wonder what uh, people make of it. People for whom English isn't their first language, I, I sometimes wonder what they make of it, given the fact that my stuff, not only is it in a foreign language, but even in English, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff uh, uh, is very, you know, it's, it's full of slang. It's, it, you know, my, my, stu my stuff is full of archaic slang and vernacular speech and uh, Americanisms, you know, so it's not entirely English. <laughs> <laughs> sure, and plus it's, uh, what's the, possibly the oddest country you've ever played? I would say uh, Estonia. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really didn't expect anybody to get it there, but I was I was proved wrong, you know. There was uh, 2,000 people uh, that seemed to be getting it. <laughs> uh, they asked me a lot of intelligent questions, not all of these 2,000 people, but they asked uh, those who got through to me asked a lot of intelligent questions. And uh, so that was a great surprise. Have you ever been asked 2,000 questions by anyone? 2,000? No, it's, yeah. it's got to have a bit amounted to much more than that, actually, 2,000. <laughs> Christ, people never run out of questions for me. <laughs> well, I hope that doesn't happen to me for all of a sudden. I have plenty of questions for you, though. Well, that, but <laughs> that's why we're here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I hope uh, not 2,000, though. No, I, no, I, no. I'm hoping I have my dinner very shortly. <laughs> 1,999, I believe. Okay, though. okay I'll be <laughs> very, counting. Very close to those I'll but, uh, be keeping score <laughs> uh, and the camera is keeping score as well and the audio is keeping score so but uh, you know what comes across for us in that international crowds is that uh, it's un really universal and in, in the end isn't it yeah I guess so the uh, the stories uh, that are encased in my poetry if any uh, those uh, are to do with the uh, the eternal and universal values of life yeah yeah, I would so, say so. Do you find that there are, there are certainly, I can imagine, uh, universal twats in any country? Oh, absolutely. That's probably the most universal poem I ever wrote. <laughs> Everybody wants to kill somebody. <laughs> or give them a right slap in the face or something. <laughs> exactly. So that, that poem is a, a useful social safety valve uh -huh. in any country, I, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an, it's a, exactly, that's a safety valve. That's an, a curious expression. I, I, I totally can understand. Uh, you need to let, let some steam off anyways. Anyway, Exa I mean. uh, Exactly. Uh, better to use words than weapons, exactly. in every case. Exactly. Lesson lessons to the world, kiddies. Don't, don't slap your mates. Don't <laughs> write don't poetry. slap your pals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, uh, but you probably get this a lot now, and I, I'm not sure if I shouldn't even be starting with this, but I, whatever. Uh, that uh, because I want to be yours has become such a, you know, like, your, oh, your staple. Yes. And because it was uh, used by, by Alex Turner, and quoted by Alice Turner, quoted by Alice Turner, and used on his sleeve of a single, I think, of, that they did, or the album, or something. And uh, that it was the last track. It was the last track on the album A.M. Mm -hmm. in uh, 2014, and that was the best-selling smash hit album worldwide by a long way that year. And I always think that the last track is as uh, important as the first track. Mm -hmm. uh, according to Phil Spector, who's out of circulation now, yeah, but yeah. there's that, that what, there's nothing he didn't know about making. Rest. Records, right? According to Phil Spector, when you make a single, on the fade-out finish, you introduce uh, uh, you introduce something that hasn't appeared on the rest of the records. For instance, a tambourine, a pair of maracas, a hand clap. 
anything that hasn't been featured in the rest of the record. Reason? Because that will make you want to put that record on right again, right, right from the beginning again. So if you apply that to an album, then that makes the, the final track every bit as important as the first track. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Alex Turner, who with, who, who, who with his prodigious mezzo-baritone converted a heartfelt Valentine poem written directly from my heart to my loved one. But by not doing very much, the genius of Alex Turner converted it into a, a power ballad. Uh -huh. So I can't, I can't thank him enough for that. <laughs> it's, uh, and uh, well, how you finish, since we're well, even as a performer, it's it's even more important how you finish than how you begin, right? Oh yeah, because that's what people remember. And, and uh, it's funny I mentioned the, the Alex Turner thing because I was listening to your uh, your, your re or re, re listening to your to your to your stuff and to your material and I was thinking well this is sometimes extremely specific in terms of some British things that possibly are only there for Britain even though they're universal and we can get it but as it is for instance with maybe uh, stuff from Britpop like uh, Pulp or later on with Arctic Monkeys and then I come to find that Alex Turner actually considers you like the biggest his, possibly his biggest reference ever so so you know that's oh, okay I was right then <laughs> you know? yes uh, well uh, well Alex and his pals you know the rest of the Arctic monkeys uh, they were all school school pals you know school friends and uh, they were at school at the time when uh, my poetry was on the uh, the GCSE uh, curriculum oh. you know so it would actually you know you could pass vital exams uh, by having a knowledge of, uh, of some of my stuff so um, wow. that, that's when he first came in came to hear my uh, came to read my poetry and uh, like a lot of uh, school children of his generation uh, I was very popular uh, with, with that with those people and uh, that's great that's got me a whole new generation of fans so now in England you know there is no uh, it's pan generational you know there are people of 65 and over and people of 16 and under who uh, who are very uh, enamored of my poetry that's so like anti-subversive anti isn't it like you started off maybe against these institutions and then then they welcome you into the 20 years in or something it's very well, odd well that's the historical <laughs> perspective you know we're yeah. taking we're talking about uh, a phenomenon that's taken 30 years to uh, to, to reach that point you uh -huh. see what I mean so yeah, sure, sure. so what was uh, radical and, uh, and uh, trailblazing 30 years ago is uh, kind of uh, reaches a kind of acceptance in a 30 Five year period, you know what I'm saying? Yes. So, uh, so it has its particular voice and a very particular tone, though. What you're doing is not very common at all, still. You know? Oh, even now it's even not. Now. No, no, it was always. I, I think that is the uh, that is really uh, the. Um, I don't think poetry uh, per se will ever be a, a mass enthusiasm. Do you, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. it's seen as a rarefied world of uh, of scholarship and. Uh, lofty ideals um, even so, even when it's made to be like the, the, the to that. Yeah, sure, I sure. single-handedly <laughs> ended that uh, assumption slapping your mates again yes <laughs> <laughs> there you go. even when it's uh, when it's uh, that, that is my great contribution <laughs> to poetry I uh, certainly democratized it in England anyway fantastic and what do you find uh, actually one thing I wanted to mention because I've been re-watching uh, this series from the early 80s called the young ones, which I grew up on, uh -huh. uh, and it was had uh, very leftist, uh, leftist um, uh, politics uh, undertones. Uh, uh, not undertones, actually overtones, really. Uh, but uh, with uh, with Rick Mail and with late Rick Mail and uh, Alexi Sale and well, Rick Mail. Rick Mail's character in that was, uh, although he would never have admitted it, and, and and none of them would. Everybody likes to. Every artist likes to foster the illusion that they come straight out and nowhere uh -huh. but of course this never happens and that whole character of Rick Mail's anarchist poet was obviously uh, based on me <laughs>
without That's where I was, I was going to ask, yeah. and there you go. <laughs> exactly. Because I felt like... If was you it... don't agree, take me to court. <laughs> Cause, cause take obviously... me to court. Sue me if you don't agree. Because <laughs> obviously, like in the late 70s, how many people's poets were there? No one. <laughs> no one. No, 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 it was you. <laughs> you and uh, fake Rick Mail who uh, wa wanted to listen to Cliff Richard. Did you like Cliff Richard? I, 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 I like Cliff Richard in, uh, uh, in between the years 1958 to 1960. Yeah, I thought Cliff Richard was a very uh, credible uh, rock and roller back then in England. Anyway, you know there were there were really the three top guys or the four top guys then would have been Cliff, Tommy Steele, Billy Fury, who's my personal favourite, and uh, Marty Wilde. Because I found I found out recently through a YouTube video with the on Amoeba Records that most of your record choices are really old school rock and roll. So well, that's what you really like to listen to. My net is really wide, you know. I mean, uh, my, you talk about my six music. Uh, uh, the what's, my, what's in my bag? I got, I got well. Oh right, that yeah, one yeah. I did in Los Angeles yeah, yeah, at Amoeba, uh, Amoeba Records. Yeah, yeah. That was a great afternoon. But I also I do a little bit of DJing on uh, BBC Six Music, oh, oh. which goes out on all you know digital media. Mm -hmm. And occasionally I do that show standing in for uh, Jarvis Cocker. Fantastic. So if Jarvis is out on the road anywhere, you know, uh, I take over his show. It's either me or Iggy Pop that takes over his show. And both Iggy and I uh, have very similar playlists. You know, really? we, yeah, we cover a, a hell of a lot of ground. You know, I, I play a lot of soul music, you know, surf, even Sinatra and Peggy Lee and Ray Charles, things like that. You know, I like all kind of popular music. Fantastic, fantastic. And that's a bunch of legends in itself, like the, 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 that uh, group of the three people. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, the only compulsory artist I have when I do it is uh, I have the Elvis, uh, the compulsory Elvis number. And because it goes out on Sunday, I have the Sabbath special, which is usually somebody like, you know, uh, Sam Cooke and the Soul Stirrers, you know, uh, the Million Dollar Quartet, the, the, the Dixie Hummingbirds, you know, some kind of upfall kind of Christian st sort of thing, uh -huh. you know, uh, the Louvin Brothers, uh -huh. Bill Monroe. So those are my two touchstones that don't vary on my uh, Six Music show, the, El the compulsory Elvis track and the Sabbath special. <laughs> Fantastic. After that, anything goes, you know, and anything within reason, you know, a lot of, as I say, a lot of soul music, surf, the Ramones usually get a look in my favorite band ever. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. And uh, what's your favorite Al favorite Al uh, Elvis uh, thing? My, oh Christ! It's it, the '66 it, one, the special he did, to me is like a mind blowing. Oh, that's sensational, that's sensational because it is such a remarkable comeback. But to people like to, to fanatics like me, he never went away, you know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I love his early. I like all periods of Elvis. Uh -huh. I, I love the stuff. I love his Vegas period, you know, the suspicious minds, burning love, you know. But. Uh, Favorite Elvis tune? That's that's just impossible. <laughs> that's he he just covered all bases. It's true, it's true, it's true. It's true. Um, I would like to ask you because um, uh, we're uh, short, running a little bit sh uh, short on time. Uh, but now, uh, would uh, would it be uh, would it be um, what do you find to be subversive about in uh, what what about this, do you f find the need to be subversive in the current uh, England or the world really? In, in, in a way, it was never my uh, intention to be uh, subversive or. Or, so the renewer is it right? Yeah. Or that political in any way, you know? Oh. I, I, it really wasn't a sort of plan. I just thought that somebody like me writing poetry at the time, somebody like me writing and reciting poetry at all, was real unusual, you yeah. know. Yeah. So don't, don't confuse the unusual with subversive, no. you know. I really sure. didn't. I don't think a, a poetry can actually change. Well, but society about in a wide certain sense, you know. Yeah, sure. I think it's more of a personal, uh, it's more of a personal thing with poetry. You, uh -huh. you know, you're, you're getting people on an intimate level, I think, yes. with poetry. So if you leave it kind of wide open and... Uh, I couldn't explain how it, my style at all. I don't really think about it that much otherwise. It's a common superstition with any artist that if you analyse what you do too much, then you become kind of a parody of yourself. You know, it's a great danger of this. Uh -huh. So I never an really analyse what I do. But it was never really my intention to uh, disrupt society, uh, 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 the, uh, the wider society in any way, you know. But, uh, but even if it, if it isn't where I you're playing, I, I mean. I guess I am seen as an adversarial voice. Yeah. 
in society. Plus, that's how you evolve as a society, I believe. You need to have those. Yeah, those you got to have that. you got to have that. But at, the same time, really. but at the same time, you've got to make people happy. And, yeah. uh, you know, it can't be like a, a sermon or something like that. My main concern is that people should be enjoying it on some level, you know. Mm-hmm. Plus, plus, you're doing uh, your, 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 your live act is a mix between uh, performance, uh, performance poetry and uh, stand-up, which is, uh, again, unusual in its own. On its own. I've always, I've always, yeah, I've always done a few gags with it, you know, yeah. because of the uh, where I started in uh, when I started reciting my poetry in the UK. It was before the punk rock thing, and uh, I was working with a lot of old school comics in what they call the Northern Club Circuit, oh. the working men's clubs. And who was that? The who, who did you play with? Uh, a lot, of, a lot of local comedians that have since had a terrible press. Bernard Manning, uh, Jerry Harris, Al Showman, no people idea. like that, you know. And I'm a big comedy buff. I don't know. I, don't know. I will look, look into that. Oh, they real old school. These are real old oh, school oh, guys, you know. Real uh-huh. blue <laughs> blue collar humor. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 I, I love love some. Like, it's not so much blue collar humor, but I love Vic Reeves and Bob Martin, for instance. Yeah, they're and good. I, they're blue collar. They're, they're from the color, north of England. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I love them. I love them. They're really. You you couldn't. I, I think they're amazing. They're good, amazing. Good. Thanks for bringing them up. Yeah, I love <laughs> no. Vic Reeves. Because when you mention blue collar comedians from the north, I, f- I those are, I guess are my favorites in that tone at least. And yet the they have a very they have a very surrealistic edge oh, to so them, good. you know. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, Vic, Vic is, uh, is a fine art student, so yes. he's an artist. So he actually builds all those yes, things he up. Actually, you know, the word surreal uh, <laughs> crops up a lot. It's yeah. crawled into everyday language now. But yeah. Vic is one of those one of the few people that understands from an artist's point of view the true meaning of surrealism uh-huh. I feel true, true, true. I, the, one last question I need to uh, to address because this goes for a show called Made of Things which is uh, based on the assumption that you are doing what you're doing because you read or listened to or or saw a movie or something that happened in your life that made you want to do this forever really so uh, because it takes it's, you know it takes some effort to do this did you have that moment at what was it well I was just generally uh, you know I was uh, a great reader when I was a a child on account of, uh, although I didn't go to school much, but what I did come away with was hyperliteracy. I had tuberculosis as a child, which kept me off school a lot, but it meant that I was, uh, uh, I spent a lot of time alone indoors, so I read a hell of of a lot when I was young. And uh, so, you know, literacy to me has always been paramount in my life. And did you have um, a book that clicked, or an author that clicked? Yeah, well, I was always fond of poetry, and particularly uh, the poetry of uh, in, in English, uh, English uh, John, Sir John Betjeman, and uh, I particularly uh, loved the poetry of uh, in translation of uh, Charles Baudelaire. Okay, okay, okay. So Baudelaire's your guy. Yeah, he's my okay. guy. Yeah. Your guy. Thank you so much. Thank you thank so much you, for your thank time. Thank you very much. It was indeed. lovely. Thank you. And I hope to to see you again soon sometime. I hope, I hope it goes over here, right? Do you, and do you that you enjoy Portugal? Have you been enjoying Portugal? Actually? I'm only here for a, for one full day, but so far it's been fabulous. Yes, fantastic. thank you. Thank fantastic. you for inviting us. And fantastic to, for, for being here and fantastic for talking to us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, we should take a picture. Uh, we should, uh, sitting down is fine. Okay. Oh, st- standing up maybe. Okay, rather. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, no, we, we should look be for pretty fantastic, of course. <laughs> oh, there's the album yeah. cover. There's the awesome. album cover. There's the album during, cover. During the, What's during the name the of our band? Uh, I'll come back to you on that. Cock buzzes. Jack shit. <laughs> Jack shit. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, I love that. Perfect band name. Thank you so much. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Thank you. See you next time. Next time. Next time. Thank you very much. Always next time. back. I love doing this and it was an absolute pleasure. I'll be quick this time to say my bye-byes. So uh, don't forget to follow Made of Things on YouTube, Instagram and Twitter and download the audio episodes on WordPress. Take care my babies! Mm-hmm.